presumably not keeping up with the president's unhinged tweets by Brian R. Smith at Getty Images. President Donald Trump, who is apparently one of the few people who becomes angrier and more agitated on vacation, took a break from golfing at his bucolic Bedminster, New Jersey club this week to casually threaten North Korea with nuclear annihilation, a taunt that Kim Jong-un gamely lobbed back. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States, the president warned, or they will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. In response, the Hermit Kingdom said it was thinking about attacking Guam and also called Trump's statement nonsense and claimed only absolute force can work on him. The next day, minutes after Secretary of State Rex Tillerson assured the world there was nothing to worry about, Trump tweeted, My first order as president was to renovate and modernize our nuclear arsenal. It is now far stronger and more powerful than ever before. Various Trump aides, advisers, and White House staffers downplayed the president's escalating rhetoric, signaling that he should not be taken seriously. But Trump, as usual, countered their best efforts by insisting that he should be taken very seriously. Let's see what he does with Guam. If he does something in Guam, it will be an event the likes of which nobody's seen before. What will happen in North Korea, Trump told reporters Thursday, adding, amazingly, that his comments weren't a dare but a statement of fact. Markets, which have been really quite forgiving for the majority of the Trump experiment thus far, broke their 10-session winning streak on Tuesday and finished down the next two days. The so-called fear index, the VIX, hit its highest levels since the election. But, overall, in light of the fact that we're now at the stage of Donald Trump's presidency where NHES prodding the one world leader who may have a thinner skin than him, who happens to have at his disposal a stash of nuclear weapons, the response from investors has been a resounding A. Despite modest declines, thus far, the market response has been modest, Dirk Willer, Citigroup's head of emerging markets strategy said in a note to clients on Friday. According to Willer, that reflects the experience of investors that geopolitical rhetoric can quieten as quickly as it escalates and a conviction that the true risk of military confrontation is minimal. As the Wall Street Journal's Spencer Jacob notes, this has been the position investors have been taking for years an analysis of 80 international incidents involving North Korea and its nuclear program since 1993 shows little connection between tensions on the Korean peninsula and financial markets. The 36 North Korean nuclear missile tests detailed by the Arms Control Association were followed on average by a declining 0.4% on the SP-500 in the following session. The average drop would be half as much if not for a single large market tumble 19 years ago, clearly resulting from Russia's debt default and not North Korea's missile testing. If this turns out to be a full-blown crisis, you would see much more dramatic moves in gold and the dollar, Julius Baer's Christian Gattaker Eriksson told the journal. But we haven't seen anything close to that yet, but like, what if it becomes a full-blown crisis, given the two egomaniacs involved who are prone to overreaction? Well, if you're focused on making money as the threat of extinction bears down, the journal's money beat has got you covered. Nordia analysts suggest that German bunds, the perennial refuge of panicked investors, would be good to own during a nuclear conflict too, with aggressive buying pushing the spread between German 2 and 10-year bonds to 0.5 percentage point, from above 1 percentage point now. On the other hand, Jakob writes that by one school of thought, the larger the potential conflagration, the smaller the market reaction should be. If the outcome is binary, a choice between nothing happening and a global thermonuclear conflict, then it makes no sense to sell stocks. That seemed to be the conclusion during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world came closer than ever to that possibility and the Dow fell less than 1% for the WIC, or as emerging markets guru Mark Mobius told Bloomberg in May, if there is a true threat of going to nuclear war with North Korea, there's nothing you can do about it. If something breaks out, we're all finished anyway. If you would like to receive the Levin Report in your inbox daily, click here to subscribe. Fiduciary rule like and to legalization of slavery actually working out pretty well for Wall Street back in June, a Department of Labor rule that requires brokers to act in the best interest of retirement savers began to take effect, to the outrage of its critics. One of them, the former Wall Street financier turned former White House communications director Anthony Scaramucci equated it with Dred Scott v. Sanford, the landmark decision by the Supreme Court to legalize slavery. 
Another, former Goldman Sachs Sachs president turned national economic advisor Gary Cohn, said it was like unreasonably putting only health food on the menu rather than delicious junk food, just because you might die younger, obviously, underneath all the opprobrium and protests about consumer choice and client freedom, was the fact that the industry wanted to be able to sell products that could make more money, rather than be held to a rule that would task brokers and advisors to work in the best interest of their clients. But now that they are in the early phases of complying with this hideously unfair regulation, how are things working out if we're evaluating it by money made, which Wall Street obviously is pretty damn well per the Wall Street Journal adherence is proving a positive. Firms are pushing customers toward accounts that charge an annual fee on their assets, rather than commissions which can violate the rule, and such fee-based accounts have long been more lucrative for the industry. In earnings calls, executives are citing the Department of Labor rule, known varyingly as the dollar fiduciary rule, as a boon. Primarily because of dollar and market appreciation, assets are growing in fee-based accounts, said Stiffel Financial Corp. Chief Executive Ronald Krushevsky, on a call in July. Credit Suisse bans trading in Venezuela debt and like you know foe back in May, Goldman Sachs found itself in a bit of hot water the likes of which it hadn't experienced since the financial crisis, when, rightly or wrongly, it became the face of Wall Street greed. This time, the bad press stemmed from a Wall Street Journal report that the firm's asset management arm had purchased $2.8 billion worth of Venezuelan bonds that had been held by the country's bank. Despite the fact that Goldman had gotten a really great deal on them 31 cents on the dollar, the fact that Venezuelans are currently under the thumb of authoritarian President Nicolas Maduro, who has cancelled elections, restricted imports of food and medicine, and whose government's clashes with protesters have resulted in more than 100 people dying in the last several months, left critics deeming that Goldman was effectively providing funding to keep Maduro's regime in power. Members of the opposition party have threatened to refuse to do business with the bank if they take over the government, and protesters have gathered outside the company's New York headquarters to decry the hungry bonds that National Assembly President Julio Borges has described as the bank's attempt to make a quick buck off the suffering of the Venezuelan people. And now, Credit Suisse has to go ahead and do this Credit Suisse Group hack has barred its traders from buying or selling certain Venezuelan securities as the political and economic crisis in the South American country intensifies. The Zurich-based bank will no longer trade two bonds issued by the government and the state oil company or any notes from a Venezuelan entity issued after June 1, according to an August 7 company memo seen by Bloomberg. The lender is also restricting business with Venezuelan private individuals and companies. A Credit Suisse representative confirmed the memo's contents. The prohibited securities are government debt due in 2036, as well as 6% coupon bonds issued by Petróleos de Venezuela, or PDVSA, due in 2022. While most brokers are already shunning the securities, Credit Suisse is the first known to formally ban them. The memo says that in light of the political climate and recent events in Venezuela, and actions taken by the current government, we want to ensure that Credit Suisse does not provide the means for anyone to violate the human rights of the Venezuelan people, which is not the sort of language Goldman Sachs, which sold some of the bonds in June, really needs right now. Of course, it should probably be noted that the Swiss bank was happy to do business with Venezuela before at WASNT Credit Suisse is distancing itself from the nation after having benefited from its role as financial advisor for a $2.8 billion bond swap PDVSA conducted in October. It's unlikely another business opportunity of that kind will emerge as long as the borrowing costs for the company in Venezuela remain prohibitively high. The Mooch can't wait to embark on his media tell towards twitter.com Scaramucci status 89571205300818326 Elsewhere Snap is getting destroyed because of its unwillingness to work with Wall Street, an analyst says CNBC GM accuses bankruptcy trust of secret $1 billion stock plot Bloomberg Donald Trump, Swamp King, is officially swimming in Washington money the hive this is how we do business here, the potential hires were allegedly told. Have you ever been to an interview with a sex doll NYP London banker denies being jogger who pushed woman in bus path Bloomberg modest rise in U.S. consumer prices may delay Fed rate hike Reuters and earnings calls. Corporate leaders openly bemoan DC's lack of direction CNBC J.P. Morgan plans to charge $10,000 for entry-level equity research Bloomberg avocados and Game of Thrones are all part of Bitcoin's record rally Bloomberg missing Connecticut Llama reunited with owners UPI.